to uh, Morgan Brown mm -hmm. from Miami and here? Uh, I don't think that one's correct. So. <laughs> uh, just from the University of Miami. Okay, from yeah. Miami. Yeah. Uh, the title is The Skeleton of a Product of Design Writers. Yes. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity to uh, come here and speak. So uh, today, I'm going to be working over field evaluation, which for our purposes will be the uh, ring of formal Laurent series over the complex numbers. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we have evaluation which goes from the units in this field to the integers. And of course what this does is it just takes some power series, you know, and so these are allowed to be negative, that's what makes it the Laurent, Laurent series, to the uh, exponent of the first non-zero term. And what having this valuation does for you is that uh, you get a valuation ring R, which is the ring of formal power series. And so this is, of course, everything with positive valuation along with zero. You know, often we, of course, say that the valuation of zero is plus infinity. And there's the residue field. write small k for, which of course will be the complex numbers. And what we'll be doing today is considering uh, projective varieties over this field. So if we consider, uh, let's say x a, let's say for starters that it's a smooth projective variety. And the way one should think of this is that this is somehow like the functions on a punctured unit disk. So you have some you know, formal family of varieties over that. And then the problem that we're trying to solve is to extend that over the puncture, to extend the family from K to R. So this is the, I'll call this the degeneration problem. So let's extend x to xr, uh, so over r, such that, well, we want xr flat, projective, and when we extend scalars back to k, we just, or, or when we, uh, uh, look over the generic fiber, we get uh, the original variety back. And, well, we want it to be not too singular. Okay, so the example I always have in mind when I'm thinking about these things is uh, a uh, degeneration of genus one curves with uh, multiplicative reduction. So if I take something like x is equal to the vanishing of uh, x, y, z plus t, x cubed plus y cubed z cubed. Uh, and then this is inside uh, p to k. Well, and then here this is over k, this is just a smooth genus one curve because you know, here if I take, you know, the, the, it's because for some value of t this is smooth. Um, and so then it's gonna be smooth for a generic value. Um, I guess I need parentheses there. And it's kind of clear, at least one way to extend this to R, which is that, well, this equation makes, you know, perfectly fine sense over R. Uh, you know, I can just, you know, there's no negative powers of T appearing, so I can just take what looks like the same variety just using the same equation. So you can take XR is V of the same equation. But of course, this is, you know, the, this is no longer smooth over R because the special fiber isn't a smooth variety. So the, the, uh, the picture you get is you have some, you know, genus one curve degenerating to three lines, the three coordinate lines. And, but this is still good enough for our purposes because here the special fiber
is at least reduced and has simple normal crossings. So these are the kinds of things we're going to want for our models over R. OK, so I'm just going to say for the purposes of this talk is that we will say that a DLT model XR is semi-stable if the special fiber XK is reduced. And what I mean here by DLT model is simply that the, uh, the pair XR with the special fiber is DLT. So, you know, of course, SNC is good enough for that. So this is kind of the, uh, the op. Say again? Uh, divisorial log terminal. Um, let's see, so I'll just briefly define it's, this is, e, uh, let's say, XR, XK, DLT. This means that it's, so log canonical. So you know this is a condition on the log canonical center on the on the discrepancies of a log resolution, and then along with uh, its SNC near log canonical centers. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, you can pretty much always, when I say DLT, replace it with SNC, and things will be more or less fine. Okay, so the object that I want to study, given one of these things is the, uh, is the dual complex. Uh, simple normal crossing. So. Do you assume X is the middle K to reduce it in Um. Yeah, otherwise this is redundant, so no, I don't. I mean, yeah, because the idea is going to be MMP guarantees you, you know, in whatever circumstances that you get, you know, a minimal model, but it's not going to, you know, make it so you get rid of everything of higher multiplicity. So, because, you know, when you think about semi-stable reduction, to get rid of the higher multiplicity, you actually have to change the base. Yeah, so you assume X, DK, X, the little K, Q. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's my definition for, of semi-stable, is that, uh, is that, that this, so this is, you know, x sub k, you know, this is equal to xr tensor over k, a tensor with k, right? So it's just like, you're just setting t equal to zero, and then you get some scheme, and, you know, either it's reduced or it's not. So it's not just, it's not the reduced special fiber, it's like the, you know, the actual Cartier divisor you get from taking the uniformizer. Okay, so, Given all that, I want to define the dual complex. So this is PK or uh, Which one is? So this one should. Uh, this is a small k. This is also a small k. Yeah, this is the special fiber. Maybe I should start calling this x0 if that makes it harder to, if, make, if that makes it less ambiguous. Hopefully I'll stick to that. Okay, so let's let uh, x delta be uh, and, you know, either SNC or DLT pair. The definition works for both. And then the dual complex is the intersection complex given as follows. And the idea is that the, you know, the vertices correspond to components of delta. And then the K cells will correspond 
to, again, components, irreducible components, of course, of uh, each of the k-fold intersections. Okay, and so, you know, the example to keep in mind, of course, is this one. So, So over here where I have my degenerating genus one curve, then in the special fiber, so if I want the dual complex, so we'll write D of X delta for this complex. And then so if I have the XR over there, then D of XR X zero, well, it just looks like here I have you know, Vz, Vx, and Vy. Then I assign vertices to each of those divisors, to each of those components, and they pairwise intersect. So I have you know, something corresponding to Vz, something corresponding to Vx, something corresponding to Vy. And then the, these two uh, divisors intersect, so I connect them. These two intersect, I connect them. These two intersect, I connect them. But of course, I don't fill in the middle because there's, you know, there's no intersection of all three because these are the coordinate hyperplanes of a projective space. Okay, so I'll just say briefly, you know, why we want to study this. Well, I mean, the basic reason is because, well, this is something you can, you know, Algebraic geometry is complicated, and this is something that you can, that's a little more combinatorial that you have a hope of computing, um, even though, you know, sometimes that can get pretty complicated. Um, but, you know, whenever you have a situation like that, what you'd like is that the uh, invariant you're computing actually tells you something interesting that you wanted to know already. So, I would say one of the main motivations is from Hodge theory. So, there's a lot of people to credit with this, but I guess the kind of the biggest person probably is Deline. Um, and the idea is that the topology of this complex tells you something about the mixed Hodge theory of the, you know, of the, you can either think of it as the open variety with, if you remove the divisor or of the uh, singular divisor itself. Um, so this comes up a lot, and this was uh, alluded to in uh, Prof Professor Alexeyev's talk earlier. Um, that this dual complex, you know, recent work of, especially of Kinsevich and Soibelman, um, they, uh, they use, well, something like this dual complex to define how to construct uh, a mirror to a degeneration of K3 surfaces. So that's something that's actually going to motivate a lot of the constructions I will talk about later. Um, and then finally, this is a little bit more of how I got into this subject, is just by rational geometry. And the idea here is that these dual complexes give you interesting by rational invariants of your pair. And so I want to mention the work of Stepanov and de Fernay Polar and shoot. Okay, and so, you know, motivated from kind of this angle, the question I want to raise now is how much this dual complex changes under birational operations. Or thought of another way, so, to what extent does the generic fiber determine the topology of uh, the dual complex of the special fiber? Okay. And so I want to mention some work of uh, 
the Fernet, Kohler, and Shu in more detail. And so what they do is they say, consider um, just any, let's say, uh, S and C pair x delta. And so here I want to assume that delta you know, has coefficient 1 in every component, just for simplicity. And then let's let y gamma be a log resolution. And so by this I mean that, that uh, uh, gamma is also SNC in that you know, it includes all the components of delta, um, but also includes all the exceptional components, and, and that's everything in, in gamma. And then, uh, so for one, the two dual complexes uh, are, and you know, the other dual complex are homotopy equivalent. So that's one result, but often we want better than homotopy equivalent. We want the dual complexes to be identified. We want them to be homeomorphic. And they give a nice condition when these are homeomorphic, and that's that if, you know, so the, the map f from y to x is log crepent, i.e., a y plus gamma is equal to f upper star of a x plus delta. Then f induces a PL homeomorphism between the two dual complexes. Okay, and so to illustrate this. Let's go back to the example where we had a, uh, a curve degenerating to the three lines. Yes? Um, so just a reference question. Yeah. The same thing with this version. Uh, which one? The SNC version. Oh. Um, if, you, if you refer to DLT, maybe that's Okay, yeah, maybe I want DLT then. There's a lot of names that I should be writing down, yeah. so it's, you know, it's always the dangerous thing to give a talk. But uh, yeah, you're probably right because this has a this has a long history. Yeah. So yeah. So let's let's go back to the, uh, the idea where we have a curve degenerating to the three lines, and then um, if I want to produce new models of this, but well, one way to do that is to do birational operations in the special fiber because that's going to give me a uh, a model of. Uh, you know, a model over R that didn't change anything over the generic fiber. So I'm going to write down two points, Q and P. And so here, the dual complex is again a triangle. So if I consider, you know, blowing up at P, then that's a toroidal blow up. And so the dual complex is just a subdivision of the previous dual complex. So what happens is that the, the blow up, the point I'm blowing up, corresponds to some valuation along this line. And so what I'm getting is I'm getting a dual complex, which is PL homeomorphic, just given by the fact that I subdivided this line here. Whereas if I blow up at Q, then what I have is now I've introduced this new divisor shooting off of the this the, the point on this divisor that I blew up at. And you can see that now the topology has changed. The homotopy type hasn't changed, but the uh, overall topological type has. So the dual complex looks like this. OK, and so this result is kind of telling us that if we want to kind of come up with the best or somehow minimal dual complex, we need to look at this information coming from discrepancies coming from birational geometry. So. Uh, oh, so you mean that 
that if you have a homeomorphism. Um, there's a version of this which is true. Um, basically, if you're only getting the, because you can identify, so this is, you know, I'll, this will come up later in my talk, but you can identify this dual complex with the space evaluations, and if you're getting the same space evaluations, then it's log Kruppen. So if you, if you never introduce any new valuations, then it's log Kruppen. But I guess I could see something where, you know, for example, if, if your dual complex looks like this, and then you blow up a point on here, then it's like elongated, like if you blew up a point on here, then that would be like elongating this. And so that's, uh, I mean, these two are homeomorphic, but it's not really a homeomorphism induced by F, and, it's, and you're getting new valuations. So there's a version of that statement which is true. Okay, so, so the other, um, so the, the, the main technical tool I want to uh, introduced to kind of organize all of this is Berkovich space. So it's time for a crash course in non-Archimedean geometry. Um, so I won't give too much of the motivation here just because we're short on time, but uh, I will just brief briefly state the definitions and kind of draw the one picture that people usually draw. So, so, given some variety x over uh, our field k, which was, you know, had some valuation. So, and this works pretty generally over, uh, over any field of valuation. Um, we can define the Berkovich analytification just as a topological space to be so the following. So the idea is we take a scheme theoretic point of X and then we take a valuation on the function field at that point. But we want it to be an R valued valuation instead of just a discrete one. And we want that if I restrict to the base field, which I can do because of course uh, this is an algebra over the base field, then I should recover my original valuation. Okay, and so the slogan is that these, this is the space of valuations on OX extending valuation on the base. And I do want to topologize this, so the way we topologize it is we use the coarsest topology such that the forgetful map is continuous. So this is just I forget the valuation. And so are the maps given by just taking a valuation and sending it to the evaluation at, uh, along some function f. So this is evaluation at f, where f you know, is some function. So these are the, like the tropicalization maps relative to the function f. Okay, so so I should give you an example, and it's going to be the same example as before. Is that here x is again equal to v of uh, x y z plus t uh, times x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed. So if you've heard anything about Berkovich spaces, then you've probably heard that a Berkovich curve is this kind of infinite graph. And so for a Berkovich P1, it's an infinite tree. Uh, but here we have a genus one curve with a multiplicative reduction, so we actually get an infinite graph that has a cycle in it. So the picture for Xn is the following. So of course, every picture you draw of, of one of these spaces is fake because there's always this kind of crazy infinite branching. But the idea is that we want to understand these valuations. Uh, one way to understand them is via geometry. And so what happens is we get the three valuations corresponding to this divisor here, this divisor here, and this divisor here. Because the order of vanishing along each of these divisors gives a valuation of the function field. And 
that has some, you know, and that can be rescaled to recover the valuation uh, on K. So this is really extending that valuation. So we get that point, that point, and that point. And then the intersections allow us to interpolate. Because, for example, if we blow up at uh, one of those points, it gives us a valuation here. And then we can just, you know, keep and get kind of, uh, you know, a Q worth of points in here. But we can also just take any monomial valuation in there, and that's going to give us a continuum. So we really do connect these up, these up, and these up. And then in the meantime, well, we had a whole bunch of other places we could have blown up along each of those lines. Namely, there's a point, you know, ex excluding this one and this one, there's an uncountable set of points corresponding to just each of the closed points along this, uh, you know, twice punctured P1 where we could have blown up. And each of those is going to give us a new valuation. And then we get all the monomial valuations in between. Ah, uh, so it's like a toric valuation. So the idea would be, um, yeah, it's real valued. So the idea is you write down uh, your function. The way you take the valuation of a function is you write down the Newton polygon. And then, you know, if you want the valuation along one of the divisors, you just uh, you just see like how low, how far up this is. And if you want it along the other valuation, along the other divisor, you see how how far along it is this way. And then um, for a monomial valuation, you're just interpolating. So you have some linear function. And then the uh, let's see, I guess it's the minimum value of this linear function along this polytope gives you the monomial valuation. And so this gives you a continuum between the vertical one and the horizontal one. So that's, those are the monomial valuations. Uh, yeah, they're given by linear functions uh, in, yeah, I mean, they're basically, if you think of, if you think of those two, uh, the functions cutting out those divisors as characters, then the co-characters are the, uh, are the, uh, are the monomial valuations. And so, like, the literal definition is, if you want to know what the, you, you pick, you know, you pick a hyperplane, uh, you know, corresponding to some linear function, and then the way you compute the valuation on, you know, some f is you write down the Newton polygon, and then you look at the minimum value of this on the Newton polygon. And so this generalizes, you know, the, just the order of vanishing along one divisor, which is just, for the vertical one, and the other divisor is for the horizontal one. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So, yeah. So, the uh, the thing that makes this complicated is you get this infinite branching structure coming from all of the different ways you can blow up at each of these divisors. But then. At each of these points, you have a new divisor, and so you get more infinite branching. You get even more infinite branching. And so it's just totally unmanageable to draw an honest picture, but hopefully this gives you some of the idea. And then I should say that there's kind of a, a more analytic perspective where, I mean, so I, I've you know, not really brought this up, but you can also assign to, uh, assign to here some kind of sheaf of functions which are supposed to be like analytic functions on the space. Um, and then the way that this is thought of is that way out in infinity, you have all of the scheme theoretic points of X, the closed points at least, and everything in here is valuations centered on the generic point. But way out here you have the closed points and then some of these, these points in between can be thought of as uh, taking a valuation where it's corresponding to some subset, where it's going to correspond to uh, the disk of, say, here, you know, maybe I have some point here, and then this is everything that only differs by t squared or something like that. Then, you know, if I go a little further out, it's differing by t. So the idea is with, the, with an attic valuation that the, the small numbers are the ones that are very divisible by t, and then the big ones that have, you know, are not very divisible by t. Um, for the purposes of this talk, though, I just want to think of this in terms of the birational geometry. Okay, so what this picture, what I'm trying to say with this picture is that, 
you know, this is a very complicated object, but there's a simple object inside which just looks like the dual complex over there. And so this is, um, yeah. So way out here we have things like xk. So the k-valued points of x are out here. So, and the way you would approximate a k-valued point is, um, let's see, so a k-valued point is like something horizontal. So, you know, maybe it goes out and intersects here, and so to approximate this point, you blow up at that intersection point, and then that gets you a divisor, and then that k-valued point intersects here, you blow up here, that gets you another divisor, and then you keep doing this process, and then in the limit, you know, so, and so that means tracing up the graph, and then in the limit you would hit this point of xk. And so likewise for the points of uh, field extensions of x as well. Okay, so So this picture where we have the, uh, the dual complex sitting inside uh, the analytification is a nice subset, generalizes, it's a very general thing. This is a theorem I'll attribute to Berkovich and uh, Trier. But I should probably be putting a bunch of other names up here as always. So, uh, so let's say given uh, x over k smooth, projective, and uh, XR SNC, let's say an XNC model, then the dual complex DXR X0 uh, embeds into XN, and the embedding is a homotopy equivalence. So, yeah, in this talk, the homotopy equivalence part isn't going to be so important to me, but uh, you, can, you can see how all of these, uh, you know, kind of hairs, they all retract down back to this ring. That, you know, this thing, it's very complicated in terms of, as a set, but in terms of its, you know, in its homotopy type, it's pretty simple, that it's all captured in this one circle. So, so this tells you how you can take any of these SNC models and produce a skeleton inside here. Uh, and then for curves, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty clear what the best skeleton you want is just from you know, understanding the sta semi-stable reduction theory of curves. But in higher dimensions, it's, you know, this picture gets a little less manageable, and so it's a little bit harder to say what the best skeleton is. And in particular, so eventually what we're going to want is we're going to be, I mean, you know, this is a little bit ahistorical, but we want to be motivated by this result that, you know, your, your skeleton, it gets more, your, your dual complex gets more complicated as you do birational modifications, but if you do crepit ones, it doesn't change. So the idea is we want to kind of just capture the, the minimum possible thing uh, that still captures all the, all the interesting structure of the analytification. So, this is going to be the essential skeleton. Yeah. So, which points of the complex parameterize some particular real value? Valuation? That's right. Can you characterize them by some property? I mean, what do you mean by, by what property? I mean, they're going to be exactly these valuations. I mean, the ones that, so this inside here, you know, so the, all of the closed points are like way out at infinity. So the points I've actually drawn just correspond to the uh, taking uh, this to be the function field. 
So you know, I can, I can take a subset of this where I have the function field. And then it's really all of the valuations of the function field, the real valued ones, that extend the valuation on the base. So that is the characterization, is that they extend the valuation on k. This, say again? Oh, which ones are in the complex? I see. Um, well, for a particular, I mean, for some models you can. Um, I mean, in some sense, this is what I'm about to define for, for like the minimal model. So you can, if you have a, if you have the DLT minimal model, then you can, uh, then you can characterize in a nice kind of intrinsic way which points these are. Um, just for an arbitrary model, then I mean, you can kind of make this arbitrarily complicated. So if it's like when you blow up that point that's sitting on one of the divisors and you add in this line, then it becomes a little bit harder to characterize this. But I guess, I mean, there's probably some way to take this definition I'm going to present in a moment and, and kind of adjust it so that you could make it, you could change what the skeleton is going to be. But yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is good motivation for what I'm about to present is that we want some way of, you know, finding the best skeleton, the skeleton for kind of the, the simplest model and expressing it in a way that's intrinsic that doesn't require us to actually calculate, uh, you know, that model. So, what do you say? No, it's not a subset of X because you're taking a point of x with some extra data. So it gets bigger than x. So there's a forgetful map that forgets the valuation that sends you to the scheme theory at points of x. Yeah, it's x, yeah, it's a point of x together with v. So here, all of these things in the middle correspond to one scheme theoretic point of x, namely the generic point. Yeah. Okay, so the essential skeleton. So the idea is going to be to try and characterize these valuations in here by what the, by using some of the something about x. And the thing we're going to use is the differential forms on x, or rather the pluricanonical forms. So I want to. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so this will be work due to Kinsevich, Seibelman, as well as uh, Rustata, and the Ks. So I want to assume that X has at least one uh, global canonical form. Uh, so this is just, you know, some omega in H0 of X, M, X. And so this is just to guarantee that I get something non-empty. You can define this when, you can, you can make the definition when there's no global polar canonical form, but it's not very interesting. And so what we can do is, given such a form, we can define a function which is going to be called the weight function so weight sub omega from x and to r okay and so well i'm going to write down this definition but it's a bit technical so before i write it down i want to say what i'm actually doing so the idea is going to be that we want our essential skeleton to be the divisors that show up in the dual complex for a minimal model, for a DLT minimal model. So this is, you know, you know, you know in the spirit of these results of Deferne, Kohler, and Shu, that you know, if you want your dual complex not to change, then you should be doing crepit blowups. So just you know, only extracting things of log discrepancy zero. So the idea is going to be that this weight function is really going to be giving us the log discrepancies. 
So, but we have to define that in a way that's, you know, appropriate to the Berkovich setting. You know, in particular, we have to worry about, you know, if you have this omega, you know, I didn't, you know, I can multiply this by t or t inverse to kind of change what its valuation is on the uh, special fiber. So we have to be a little bit careful defining this. Um, and then the idea is that the log discrepancy zero divisors, those are supposed to be the ones with the smallest log discrepancy. So what we're going to do to take the essential skeleton is find the places where this weight function is the smallest. Okay, so I want to define this weight function. And the place I want to define this is on the divisorial valuations. So, you know, of course, most of my valuations in kind of the, in the countability sense are R-valued, but some of them are discrete, and that gives a, you know, a dense set inside this picture. So the idea is I'm going to define my weight function there, and then it turns out it extends by continuity. So here's the idea. So given, yeah, we're going to extend it by continuity. That's right. So given some divisorial valuation, I guess it should be new prime. Um, we want to find, you know, some XR such that um, one of the one component E expresses uh, V prime. Okay, and so when I say E com expresses V prime, I mean that the that V prime is the order of vanishing along E up to scaling. So if E has uh, multiplicity one in the special fiber, then that's going to happen. But if E has a higher multiplicity, then we have to uh, divide by that multiplicity because the valuation is supposed to extend the valuation which is 1 on t. Okay, so, so what we do is we write, so we can just write the divisor uh, on xr of omega. So the idea is like omega gives you some uh, canonical form on XR. So the idea is this become, you know, so, you know, this extends in a, a unique way from, uh, from K to R to a canonical form, and so that gives me some divisor. So this is going to equal to the sum, you know, of a bunch of stuff, you know, so this is going to be A1, you know, AE plus some other terms, but what I care about is this A, this, you know, what the coefficient of E is in this expression. And then, let's see, what is, um, oh yeah, so, right, and then M is a, you know, so I have a, so, remember that omega is an N canonical form, and so now I can write, um, so then mu, equals m plus a. And so the, the reason this m is here is because we want to think of, you know, the idea is we just take e, uh, a that's like having the discrepancy, but we really want the log discrepancy, so we have to add something on. Okay. And then finally, we take n is equal to the multiplicity of e in x0. So this is the amount we have to rescale by. And then our weight function is going to equal mu over n. Okay, so this was kind of a mouthful, but the idea is that this is something like a log discrepancy, and then we have to rescale it according to the multiplicity of e. And so making these choices, this does not depend on the model chosen. So, again, this definition, I mean, there's like a lot going on and then like staring at it for five minutes probably doesn't really help. So let me try and give you just one example. And of course, it's the example I did before. So 
So if I take, you know, so again, I have you know, v of x, y, z plus t, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed. And then I can just take the, uh, you know, I can take a differential that's trivial along the, along the whole family. But I'll, I can then just divide that by t so it's trivial everywhere except in the special fiber. Uh, and so then its divisor is just, you know, negative one in each component. And so here, it's really going to be a log discrepancy, this thing I'm computing. So if I do the blow up here, then, you know, if I, you know, the idea is that now this divisor, because of the adjunction formula, it extends to a minus one here as well. And so mu is equal to zero. Whereas if I do the other blow up, then here, when I extend it, I get a zero. And so that means mu is equal to one. And so here, I don't even have to divide by n, this, but the n here would be two because this has you know, multiplicity coming from each component. Here, the n is one. And you know, so the, uh, you know, this mu being one, you know, it's, it changes the weight. So you know, here we can see that the, the locus where the, the weight function is minimal for this differential is going to be the same in both of these pictures. And that's how we define the essential skeleton. Okay, so I'm running a little bit short on time. Uh, but, so let me. So I may have to go a little bit fast. So there's kind of two definitions here. So the first is the Kinsevich Soybelman skeleton. Uh, and so this is the skeleton assigned to x in the differential. And this is the minimality locus of the weight function uh, corresponding to omega. And then the essential skeleton So this is the union. This was defined, so this one was defined by Kinsevich and Soibel, and this one's defined by Mustad and Nikes. Uh, and then this is just the union over all the skeletons for all the pluricanonical forms. And so this, I'll write skeleton of x. Okay, so the beauty of this is that to compute this, you only have to compute things on one SNC model, and you don't have to do any of the hard kind of birational geometry where you have to compute divisorial contractions and flips and things like that. You can just, you know, work out, you know, for enough pluricanonical forms. Well, here it seems like I need a lot, but it turns out, you know, with some assumptions from minimal model theory, you you only need finite. You only need like. Uh, you know, you only really need to do a finite amount of work. And then, you know, you can use these, and then this essential skeleton is always going to be contained in any skeleton of any SNC model. So, the other nice thing about this is that it's just, it's a birational invariant, and it, you know, and it doesn't depend on the choice of the SNC model. So, um, I'll just say in words the, the theorem due to, uh, the case in Shu, which is that if you have a DLT minimal model for uh, x uh, over r, then the dual complex of the special fiber can be identified with the essential skeleton, and then that identification gives you a homotopy equivalence with the uh, analytification. Okay, now I do want to state one of my theorems, which is what happens to this thing when you take a product? So this is a theorem with uh, Enrico Mazan. So she's a student of Nikkei's, she's uh, finishing this year. Uh, so let's suppose that 
x and y are smooth, projective. And I mean, in the paper, the hypotheses are a bit weaker, but I'll just stick with this for the talk uh, over k. And suppose at least one of these has a semi-stable model over R. So then the essential skeleton of the product it can be identified is, homo is like uh, uh, PL homeomorphic to the product of the essential skeletons. And I mean, you can, you know, you can make this map very, you know, natural in terms of, you know, pulling back valuations and things like that. Um, so I guess, so some comments on this. Um, so, you know, a friend asked me about the paper and the first thing he asked me is, why is the paper 40 pages long? Um, and so I think there's a couple of things that, or, or rather, so why it wasn't this proved a long time ago? Uh, I think the main reason is that this hypothesis is actually necessary. If you don't have this hypothesis, then the theorem isn't true. Um, and, you know, in terms of, and the reason that happens is because if you take uh, the product of two models that aren't semi-stable, then you get some, if you take their product over R, you get something that's not normal, and then the normalization does funny things. It gives you, you know, two valuations where you expected one. And so, and so then what happens is instead of this map being a homeomorphism, it's just, you know, n to one, where n is the degree of the normalization. Um, let's see. Um, I guess it's probably the most important thing to say. Uh, because I want to move on and talk about why we did this. So, you know, so why would we care so much about investigating these, pro uh, these products? Um, and what we were really interested in was degenerations of hyperkähler varieties. So, so the idea, of course, is that that hyperkähler varieties are higher dimensional analogs of K3 surfaces. Well, I mean, first time I heard that, I was like, well, I thought Calabayao's were the higher dimensional analogs of K3 surfaces, but this is a different higher dimensional analog. Um, so these are also K-trivial varieties, but these have a uh, non-degenerate uh, two-form, global two-form, which is, which is something different. So there's this uh, decomposition theorem due to Bogomolov that says if you have a k-trivial variety, uh, you know, up to some finite covers, it decomposes as a Calabi-Yau part, an abelian part, and a hyperkähler part. So this is, you know, a very important part of the classification of k-trivial varieties. Um, so these, you know, these form a rich theory, uh, but they have very few examples. Um, so the examples, I can probably just list them. Well, maybe I'll use the next board. Um, so the main ones is if you take SK3, then you take the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on the K3, this is hyperkähler. And then if you take uh, an abelian surface, then you can take the multiplication map from the Hilbert scheme to the abelian variety, and then the uh, pre-image of the identity, or I guess of any point, is hyperkähler. And then these are the only infinite families we know, and there's a few other examples due to O'Grady, so a few others. Okay, so, so one way in which these are the higher dimensional analogs of K3 surfaces is in terms of their Hodge theory and the Hodge theory of their degenerations. So you have this uh, Kulikov classification of degenerations of K3 surfaces where they come in types. We have the type one, type two, and type three. Uh, so I'm mainly gonna focus on the type three case because that has the richest structure of the dual complex. 
So for a, type, a semi-stable type 3 degeneration of K3 surfaces, you get, as your dual complex, you get uh, sphere S2. And so the question that we were trying to investigate was, what can you get for the dual complex of a type 3 degeneration of hyperkähler varieties? And so we thought we knew what the answer was supposed to be uh, because of a recent paper of, well, you know, for one thing, just by like, well, what would the nicest thing be? If you just kind of think of in terms of like what the cohomology looks like, um, which was, but uh, work by Kolar, uh, Laza, Saka, and Lazan. So I only know the way the accent goes in her name because she told me it's the opposite of Kolar. So now I always remember. Uh, so they, they showed that uh, a type three degeneration, uh, let's say semi-stable degeneration of hyperkalers, so has dual complex, which is a Q, Q cohomology, no, sorry, Q homology, CPN. And it makes sense that you should have a CPN because this two form gives you cohomology groups appearing in degrees two, four, et cetera, up to two N. And what we were able to do was use our theorem to produce examples where it was a, uh, a homeomorphic to CPN. So there exist type three degenerations. So in every dimension in both infinite families, and I guess I'll again say semi-stable degenerations, where the dual complex of the special fiber is uh, CPN. Okay, so I think this is a good stopping place. Uh, yeah, yeah, homeomorphic to CPN, let's say. Uh, semi-stable degenerations of H. Kaler. Yeah. Yeah, it's from the, uh, because the way we construct these is for for this family, it's you just take a type three degeneration, semi-stable degeneration of K3s and then take the Hilbert scheme of the generic fiber. And then, you know, and then it's, it come, it, you know, the way you construct the Hilbert scheme, one way to do it is to take the symmetric product, which is say, take the product quotient by an SN and then do some resolving of singularities. So, I mean, the beauty of using the essential skeleton is you, is you can take the, the product, take the quotient, and then you don't even have to worry about the singularities because the essential skeleton is a birational invariant. And then it's a similar type of thing for this. You said that you, you need this uh, satisfactory Yes. To guarantee that the product will stay normal. Uh, that's right. That's the well, I mean, here's, here's kind of the example, is if you take, um, you know, if you take a degree four and P2 degenerating to two doubled lines, then, um, you know, the, the complex here is just an interval. But if you take, uh, if, you take the pro if you take the product of this with itself, then it fails to be normal. And then when you normalize, what happens is you get you get one copy of every stratum except for the most singular one. So what it looks like is you get a square with one two cell attached on one side and then a second two cell attached you know, in the back. And so that's a sphere, which isn't the product of any 
you know, of any, you know, I mean, that's not a product, right? So that, that, this is the example uh, that says that, oh, you actually need semi-stable because otherwise, you know, the, because, because if you take an SNC model, like, it has to be normal. So the natural thing to take is take the product and then take the normalization, but then that changes the homeomorphism type. Yes. So the fact that uh, uh, the 